I forgot the gavel. Can you hear me? I'm calling the meeting to order. Last time they said, did I have a gavel? And I said, yes, I did. It was in the office, and then I forgot to bring it. They were calling the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the uh, February 4th, 2013 meeting of the Lowndes County Democratic Party. Um, if you would rise uh, and join me in a moment of silence to uh, pay respect for those who serve our country and those who have lost their lives in the most recent month. Thank you. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, when you came in, you should have gotten um, an agenda and a membership form, and you should have gotten the meeting minutes. But the meeting minutes didn't make it here this evening because our secretary, uh, Jarrell Anderson, and his cousin, Donnell Fussell, were in a car accident on the way here. Uh, Donnell has gone to the hospital. Jarrell is okay in finishing up the officer's report. But um, please remember them this evening as they sort of struggle through with a broken car and potentially an a injured young girl. So we will do our minutes um, from January uh, next month when we are together. Uh, Jim Parker has our financial report. Jim? Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the month, we had a balance of $2,263.25. And at the end of the month, it was $1,733.25. Thank you very much. Uh, this last month, we um, mailed a postcard to uh, our regular mailing list and to some strong and leaning Democrats who are good voters and uh, potentially are interested in joining us. And we also did a little robocall this afternoon to remind people about the meeting. So hopefully that will encourage people to hear our great speakers, because while we're not particularly in an election cycle at this time of the year, um, it is important that we find out what our government agencies do for us. Um, so uh, this evening, our elected officials with us tonight, uh, Councilman Sonny Vickers is here. <laughs> W.G. Walker, our tax assessor, is here. And I am expecting our county commissioners, but they're not here yet. Um, this evening, we have a super speaker who I've heard um, two or three times now, uh, Dr. William Grow from the Lowndes County Health Department. I heard him do a talk at Rotary last year, and uh, I said, gee, Dr. Grow, you really need to be shouting this out some more. What great stuff the health department does. And, and he um, actually agrees. Uh, the health department does some really great stuff, and he is here this evening to tell us about those things. Dr. Grow. Good to see all of you, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you tonight. I've, I've known some of you for a long, long time. Uh, I told Gretchen, I'll talk to anybody about public health anytime, and we'll get any, any advertisement we can get we need. Uh, public health is so much more than I realized before I went to work there two years ago so important a part of our community and we as I, i'll tell you in just a minute are one of the best kept secrets i was reading something today i want to share with you about about democrats uh we're talking about if harry was still be around if, if harry was still around it had to do with harry truman uh when president truman retired from office in 1952 his income was substantially a u.s army pension reported to reported to have been thirteen thousand dollars a year Congress, noting that he was paying for his stamps and personally licking them, granted him an allowance and later a retroactive pension of $25,000 a year. When offered corporate positions at large salaries, he declined, stating, you don't want me. You want the office of the president, and that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the American people, and it's not for sale. 
Even later on May the 6th, 1971, when Congress was preparing to award him the Medal of Honor on his 87th birthday, he refused to accept it, writing, writing, I don't consider that I've done anything which should be the reason for any award, congressional or otherwise. Um, politicians have changed a lot, perhaps, since then, but I tell you, he, he was one of a kind. I thought I'd just share that story with you before we get started. Uh, and again, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about South Health District, which is 10 counties in South Georgia, and I'll go through them in just a minute. I, offer, I do a legislative presentation in, uh, in December for the legislators in our area as to pretty much update them on where, where we are in public health. And I want to go through pretty much what we did for them to give you information that you may or may not know. Hopefully I can uh, uh, edify some of it. State of uh, our, our South Health District, and this was done, of course, originally in December. Uh, the Department of Public Health was established in, in, by the legislature in 2011. Up until then, we had been a division of the DCA, Department of Community Health, responsible for the public, the public health of the communities throughout Georgia with 18 health districts, 18 district directors like me, and 159 county health departments. Uh, our commissioner is Brenda Fitzgerald. I served on uh, a board with her as a doctor. She was a doctor. She is a doctor uh, 15 years ago. And uh, lo and behold, 15 years later, she's now my, my boss and our commissioner. Uh, she is a very dynamic leader, doing a lot with the department uh, and uh, out there uh, dealing with the legislator, dealing with the governor, and trying to make the Department of Public Health the very best that it can be. Uh, there is a board of public health, and this is pretty much the, chain of, uh, this is pretty much the uh, organizational structure of the governor, DPH board, sh the commissioner. Uh, district health directors, county boards of health. The Department of Public Health uh, is basically, of course, reflects Georgia. The population in Georgia increased from 8,100,000 in 2000 to 9,700,000 in 2010. South Health District, that's us right here up to Turner County, Ben Hill, Irwin, Tift, and of course, Berrien, Cook, Lanier, Brooks, Lowndes, and Eccles. That's South Health District right here. That's South. South Health District population increased from 227,000 to 256,000. However, Georgia still ranks 37th in the nation in health status with an increase in obesity from 11% to 27%, increase in smoking from 17% to 25%, and increase in children living in poverty. The mission of the Georgia uh, Department of Public Health is to protect the lives of all Georgians by preventing disease, promoting health, preparing for and responding to disasters from a health perspective. What do we do? This is what most people don't have a clue. And I'm not going to spend, it's a real busy slide, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want to go through it a little bit. For example, we, we have a whole area on, on children's health uh, here, children's medical services, children up to 21 years of age, who have asthma, who have neurological disorders like kyphosis, scoliosis, orthopedic disorders like club foot. We deal with children's medical services with asthma and cerebral palsy. We have babies can't wait, children up to three years of age who have, who have cognitive delay, especially speech impairment. And this can be children with autism, children with Down syndrome, uh, blind children, deaf children, we deal with, the, we have almost 700, 800 kids in our area that we take care of right now on our census. We do, uh, we have a referral to these programs from Children's First. We do children's immunizations in, in the ones that we take care of that don't necessarily go to pediatricians. We deal with lead poisoning. We do ec uh, education on nutrition and physical activity. I'm doing a talk on childhood obesity in the, uh, this, actually tomorrow. We deal with oral health. We have a women's, infant, and children's nutrition program. This is a $2 million program, and it is incredible uh, the extent of this with about 100, well, I guess we probably have 40 to 50 members of the WIC program to ensure good nutrition in children and infants up to two years of age and children. We have school health that work under our protocol. We actually have two of the nurses who work for the health department here at the Valdosta City School System. Women's health, family planning, trying to help women plan their pregnancies, uh, offering them information, education, 
Uh, we, we, once we do find that women are pregnant, we, we give them perinatal health and pregnancy-related services to try to ensure healthy mothers, healthy babies. We have a breast and cervical cancer program that is income-based for women who cannot afford to go to the doctor. Chronic and communicable disease, we have, we have a whole program that deals with STDs, which is very prominent, of course, in young people. HIV, we, we have the HIV program uh, that has about 120 clients in our area. Adult immunizations, we have 30 adult immunizations. We do every, everything all the time, flu, uh, shingles, and adult. I've got a whole list of 30 that I could go through that I want. Let me just sort of tell you a story here as far as meningococcal immunizations uh, and epidemiology, which, which would fall under chronic. We, we have an epidemiology department. I had a patient uh, who came to me uh, referred by a obstetrician's office one morning when I was in practice who was very sick with a rash. She got out of my office about 11 o'clock in the morning. She had a, a skin rash and a sore throat, sent her immediately to the emergency room. She had a real high fever. She really collapsed in the emergency room in septicemic shock. Before the night was over, she was in renal failure. She was in a coma. She was she had ventilatory failure and at two o'clock that morning i was intubating her putting on a ventilator a 24 year old young lady uh she coughed and of course it got all over my face it's a highly highly contagious disease i started on prophylaxis the next morning she was at a party a christmas party the night before with uh, two nights before with over a hundred people most of whom were not my patients they were calling my, my office somewhat hysterical about what they should do. Well, they weren't my patients. I couldn't prescribe for them. I didn't really know what to tell them to do except go to their doctor. If they didn't go to the emergency room, find out the public health had an epidemiologist. She could do the homework, interview them, see those that has close contact, those that need to be prophylactic, tell them where to go. If they don't have a doctor, she could get uh, the district or, or me or, my, or Dr. Lynn Feldman to, prior to me to write the prescription for prophylaxis. I got on prophylaxis, and we offer that, and you don't see any of this. You don't hear any of this. This is one of the components of what we do. Tuberculosis. Let me tell you about a tuberculosis client we had last year. The client was, was referred from Berrien County down here to our infectious disease doctor. He was coughing up TB germs, which had proved we actually identified him, tried to treat him. We, well, once we identify TB clients, we take the medicine to their homes. We take the medicine in their homes. We administer the medicine. We watch them swallow the medicine. We educate them. Well, he refused to let our nurses in his house. When they were gone, he would go out and spread, we spread TB germs all over the community. When he got referred down here, I got a call from the ID doctor. The ID doctor said, Dr. Grow, we have a public health problem. And I said, Dr. Serena, I am well aware of that. And, I, and we took the ball later and ran with it. Two Superior Court judges, two hearings, two lawyers, CEO of South Georgia Medical Center, Sheriff of Lowndes County, uh, countless man hours of time. Two weeks later, this patient was admitted to a tuberculosis prison hospital in South Carolina under court order. He was there six months. He was just released. He put on 40 pounds. His TB is in remission. He's not spreading it around the community. He's been at least probably most likely cured of it. He obviously was, and this is something the health department does that we don't advertise. We don't put it on the front page of the paper. We don't get credit for it. We're keeping the community safe and preventing disease, trying to keep the, the health of, of our citizens, and you don't know about this. This is something that public health does almost every day, not that one case. That was one of the more difficult ones we had to deal with. All right, environmental health. Let me tell you about environmental health. We do the restaurant inspections. When you see grades on restaurants, and inspect, we are the ones that do that. We had a restaurant, a brand new at the mall, that flunked the first two inspections from the state rules and regulations that we're actually enforced. Uh, we got an editorial in the Valhalla Times about we were anti-business. We were not anti-business. We are just trying to protect the health of the public. Uh, and, of course, their viewpoint was different. I don't have the platform uh, of, the, uh, of the editor's page in the Valhalla Daily Times, but we did write a letter to the editor refuting uh, their point. They did publish it, by the way. Uh, this is something we do. That's public health doing that. Septic tank placement and wells out in the counties. We're responsible for trying to keep the groundwater safe, for septic tank placement and well placement. 
uh, and and we were, I had an issue today with a, somebody who wanted to subdivide a lot, and he didn't have but one well, but one septic tank. They want to put two trailers, and these are issues we deal with almost every day that you never hear about. They get somewhat complicated and complex. Swimming pools, public swimming pools, not private. Motel swimming pools, wild adventure. We try to make sure that the water is chlorinated, the chemicals keep the bacteria down, and that it's safe for kids and children to swim in in public accommodations and public entertainment facilities that have swimming pools. Tourist accommodations. We had to close eight beds in a motel in South Lounge because of bed bug infestation two years, well, a year and a half ago. We don't put this on the front page of the paper. I got a letter from a citizen from Kentucky with the uh, re the receipt from the mot from the um, uh, receipt from the hotel motel that he was in, pictures of his leg. He'd been to a dermatologist, been diagnosed with bed bug bites. Our environmentalists went to the motel, infested with bed bugs, closed these these beds, fumigated it, got rid of the problem. Do, do we get? Do you hear about this? No, you don't. Okay, for obvious reasons, we try not to hurt anybody. We're trying to protect the public, but we're not trying to hurt any kind of business establishment either. And then body art parlors. We're responsible for seeing the body art parlors that use piercings and actually invade people's body with needles don't spread disease. And you can spread hepatitis in a heartbeat by doing this in the serious forms like B and C. Now, this is the kind of thing that I really didn't know a whole lot about when I came to public health. What we do every single day that you don't hear about and you don't know about to prevent disease, promote health, keep the public's health safety. Uh, we do health promotion with education on tobacco cessation, obesity prevention and nutrition. I'm, I'm doing a talk tomorrow on obesity in children. Uh, Vital records, you now have to have a copy of your birth certificate to get a driver's license. All right, if you didn't know that, we have those at the Lyons County Health Department, and you can't get a driver's license, anybody in this room, without proving a proof of a, either a passport or a birth certificate. When you go to renew it, when I go to renew mine in two months, I've got to, to if I don't, I fortunately have a, I think my birth certificate burned up in the courthouse in the town that I was born in 30 years ago, but I do have a passport. But you have to bring a, either a passport or a birth certificate. We do have, uh, we do partner with hospital on emergency preparedness. Uh, we, we do a lot, a huge part of, we have over a million dollars committed to emergency preparedness. What we're responsible for is housing. If, if hurricane victims were sent up here from Florida, we have to provide housing and dispense medications, insulin and other medications that are essential to people's health. And, and, and we would have to open shelters and oversee that that housing, for example, uh, right now, Mathis Auditorium, no one knows that we're involved in emergency preparedness because we haven't had, thank goodness, in this immediate area any serious emergencies in a long time. But if you did, you would see public health out there. Uh, in spite of all of this, of course, Georgia still has a serious problem. If you rank one as poor and 50 as excellent, we're still number two in obesity, number three in syphilis, number five in infant mortality, and tuberculosis, six in age cumulative cases, 17 in immunization gap, and 19 to 35 months of age, and 24% of 24 in tobacco, and I said that actually an increase. <clears throat> South Health District per capita income, and of course, if you look here at, at Lowndes, uh, in 1999, it was $17,000. In, in 2010, it's $21,000. Per, in 2011, per health spending in, uh, in the southeast states per capita, Alabama spends $68 per capita. Georgia spends $13.28 per capita. The only one ahead of uh, behind us is Mississippi, which spends $9.70 in the southeast. So we, we, and, and we, yet we have a lot of responsibilities that I was trying to tell you about just what, a little while ago. Impact of changes in the workforce because of, of economic times. In 1990, as I said, Georgia had six and a half million people. In 2010, we got nine and nine, over nine and a half million people. In 1990, we had 1,800, almost 1,800 public health nurses. 
in 2011, we've got 1,150 public health nurses. We have a gap of 800 in the state. There's a reason for that I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, and it's really a problem. Ideally, we would have one public health nurse per 5,000. Right now, we have one public health nurse in 2011 per 7,000 population. Potential impact of changes in the workforce could be impaired disaster response, increase in, in inappropriate visits to the hospital, which is the most expensive form of care, increased teen pregnancies, increased infant mortality, increased STDs, increased in strokes with hypertension that have been undetected, untreated, and same thing is true of diabetes. We've had changes in our environmental workforce. This is the demand for services. Oops, oops, uh, go backwards. This is the demand for services right here. It had gone up from 2000 to 2010, dropped back a little bit recently, but it's going back up. The blue line are environmental staffing that has dropped dramatically. They'll go about doing the environmental health check that I was telling you about just a little while ago. Uh, and the potential impact of changes there is decreased in, uh, in frequency of inspection of regulated facilities, loss of health and safety programs, emergency preparedness, uh, loss of res uh, response there, potential increase in foodborne illness, potential decrease of surface and groundwater quality, and potential property value decrease because of that. We have lost because of economic times and cut in our budget approximately 31 positions in the last year and a half. 20 full-time positions, seven positions frozen, four decreased. Most of these were in Lowndes County. Part of the problem is we have a fringe rate of 50%. What does that mean? If I want to hire a $30,000, if I want to hire, a, um, sorry, if I want to hire uh, a $30,000 employee, I've got to add $15,000 for fringes. I want, to, I want to hire a nurse practitioner to see patients down at the health department. The low end of the pay scale would be about $70,000. It would cost me, because of the state's fringe rate, $35,000 more or $105,000. I don't have that kind of budgetary flexibility. I cannot hire the nurse on the low end of the wage scale, and to start off with, they can get 10 to 15% more by going to the private sector yesterday. We're having a real, real hard time hiring people, keeping people. We haven't given a raise at the health department in six, almost seven years, not even a cost of living raise. Now, uh, this is fiscally unsustainable. I've said this, and I presented this to the state meeting uh, actually in the month of January. Financial overview, Lowndes County Health Department. If you look at our, in 2000, in, in revenue 2009 to 2013, revenue has remained fairly steady, steady. Our fund balance, unrestricted. Unrestricted means we have taken out uncompensated leave. Uncompensated leave. That's here. If you see unrestricted fund balance, meaning the amount of money we can fall back on has decreased from $750,000 $375,000. Uh, if it keeps going this way, it's going to be hard to maintain services at, at the health department, period, for that matter. And I'm just sort of sharing this with you like I've shared in, in, in the economy has affected everybody, but we don't a lot of times get the attention and the credit we, we, because we people really don't know what we do, and that's why I'm out here talking to you here today, and I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, our grant and aid from the state, which is the large amount of the money, if you see the trend line was 72, 3 million back in 2001, down to 68 million now, though our population is up by 4 million in that same period of time. Budget challenges, we got a new formula that's been applied that we in Lowndes County are taking a $150,000 cut in our grant and aid starting this year to our budget because of the new formula that had to do with poverty rate, poverty share, and population. First new formula in 40 years. County budget problems due to the economy. Decreased fees, we're not sure why people stopped coming. Was it gas to get there? We're not sure. We do have some fees we can collect. We're also uh, competing with the private sector on things we can earn fees for, like immunization, which we actually do cheaper, but sometimes patients don't know this, don't come there, or cannot get there. 
We've had decreased SHAP program, stroke and hypertension. We, 100% the clinic was closed last year. Our sickle cell program has been de decreased. Maternal child health, babies can't wait. The children's health program, babies can't wait. We had 24 members on our staff last year. We have 12 this year. Uh, it, it, we can't keep and sustain what we've been doing with these kinds of cuts. The position lost and not filled in all these programs include child health, the HIV AIDS program. It also includes the TB program, by the way. We closed both of our teen clinics. These are STD treatments, trying to prevent them from being spread more than they have been. Adolescent health program, family planning, to try to help women plan their pregnancies. All of this has taken a tremendous economic hit. Let me just share these two last two slides with you. Life expectancy in the 20th century. Average life expectancy in 1901 was 49 years of age. Okay, it's increased 57% to 78.5 years of age in 2009. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, t top 10 list of the reasons for the increase in, in life expectancy are the, are the ones we list here. And reduced infant mortality is by far the most important, but then vaccine, water chlorination. Let me tell you about water chlorination and the environmental health. When the coordinator for the city's water uh, was broken about a year and a half ago in January of last year, not two Januarys ago, as a matter of fact, two years ago this uh, last month, the coordinator for the city's water broke and water was not getting coordinated. We found out it's about 7 o'clock in the morning. Before 11 o'clock in the morning, our environmentalists had called all the restaurants in the city of Alasta and asked them to close voluntarily. I went out to the mall about 11 o'clock. There was not a single restaurant open. They can't wash dishes. They can't do anything to clean their plate, and the water is not clean and not coordinated. Uh, that happened here two years ago, and the health department was a very integral part of taking care of that. Tobacco control, cancer prevention, heart disease prevention, lead poisoning prevention, and public health preparedness. And these are all public health priorities. And the last slide, key factors. Local health departments are the best kept secret unless there's a major event, unless people get sick at a restaurant. You know, unless you hear of children swimming in a pool and getting sick from, from bad water, uh, you don't hear about us. We don't, I had Penny Houston, the representative said, why don't we advertise this? Well, one, we don't have an advertising budget. Number two, a lot of what we, we don't, if we, we could do it in a very general sense, but we try not to create issues for businesses or for people. Uh, some of it would be very protected health information, too, for that matter. So there are all kinds of reasons that we don't. In a general sense, we've had two rabies situations. One was a year and a half ago. We had a rabid donkey that, uh, a donkey now, rabid donkey that two of citizens of Lowndes County were exposed to, one bitten, uh, that we had to get to the uh, hospital to get rape started or rabies treatment. Three weeks ago in Brooks County, a rabid fox bit two citizens, and we had to get them once the fox was killed and we had the head which was positive for rabies, get them started on rabies. Again, rabies control is part of what we do. We don't advertise this, but in a general sense, we do, and we're going to start doing this more. Uh, so that we hopefully will get more attention and, and more credit, and therefore the legislators will see that we do need money to run our programs, hire our personnel. Core services are threatened, as I've already told you. So when you hear of people getting sick at a restaurant or an infant death or a teenage pregnancy or a patient with TB or meningitis or bed bugs at a motel, contaminated water, a child with Down syndrome, autism, sickle cell, clubfoot, cerebral palsy, Public health is there helping prevent disease, promote health. Thank you for your time. Open, open for questions. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them. I, I definitely have a question. What do we do to help you advertise? Or help you whatever you think is the most important thing? Talking to legislators. Um, Talk, I think word of mouth is the best advertisement you get, period. I didn't know. I practiced medicine here 37 years. I had no clue of what the health department did except 
I knew they treated some disadvantaged citizens, and I will tell you this. Um, the politically powerful generally don't know what we do. The politically powerless are our clients, and they are, a lot of them are not even registered to vote. And we advocate for them, and we take care of them every day. Uh, and that is part of the dilemma. What can you do? Keep everyone, help. thank you for having me here uh, to, to do this so I can inform citizens. I go to Rotary Clubs, I go, I go to any, any public organization, uh, government organization. I'm, I'm talking to the Lyons County Commission later this month with the same talk so that they know where we stand as far as the economy. Of course, everything is affected now. The dump's being closed, uh, you, you know, everything in the economy. Uh, and, and what can you do if you talk to legislators, public health should be there. We are given sometimes, in my opinion, uh, short shrift uh, when, you, when it comes down to uh, governmental attention. That being said, we, are, we do have a Republican administration which is trying to balance the budget and we have had some serious, serious budget cuts that have made sustaining what we do more and more and more difficult. Uh, the more we can get our message out to the public of how essential we are to the public's health, not just one citizen's health, not just a patient's health, but to the public's health, the more likely we are to get the essential funding we have to have to continue what we have to do to, pre to do the core services that are so important to everyone in this room's health that you possibly, maybe even probably didn't know about before tonight. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Bourbon? Uh, Elliot, I heard part of your question. I lost part of it. Our budget are, be, are being made with regard to the budget cuts. I'm thinking of what is the cost of these cuts? Now, here, you're talking about certain things. I'm thinking about the cost of these cuts. How much you're saving in terms of preventing disease and keeping people healthy and safe and this kind of thing, and not waiting until the diabetes is out of control and they go to the emergency room, get in the intensive care unit, spend a half million dollars, or, or they get in renal failure and, do, you know, just hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of dialysis care down the road if they've been caught earlier could largely have been prevented. These are somewhat hypothetical, uh, and, and it's not, therefore, concrete there are studies out there that said, you know, we have saved down the road millions of dollars in preventing this, that, and the other. But if it's not a really at the moment problem, uh, Elliot, it doesn't get a lot of attention. You know, you can you can try to sell this, and I will tell you, in the legislators in December, uh, all four of the representatives. Uh, one of the senators, we had one of the senators just could not come. He, he was there the uh, year before, he couldn't come this time. They basically, they heard the presentation. They understand the problem. They, they do understand the, what public health does to a large extent. They've got so many competing priorities at, 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 at the governmental level um, that it's hard to get the message through. But you and I both know, and I make this point and I've said this to patients for years, without your health, you don't have anything. You have nothing. Now, on an individual basis, patients and people understand that. On a population basis, it's harder to sell when it's not an imminent threat. But you let a flu ep epidemic come through and you see all of a sudden the government attention, they're getting H1N1 three years ago, 2010, they were throwing money at health departments as far as immunizations. A year later, we could barely get enough funding to give the few immunizations that we ended up getting. 
because it was a present threat, H1N1. If you remember when they, the swine flu that had mutated and was going to be such a huge threat, it really worked out not to be. Uh, H1N1 is still, we are actually still this year, the, the one that was H2N3, it was a variant of that same virus. Uh, and we did have the worst heat flu of an epidemic we had this year, probably in my experience in Vault Austin, Lyons County in 10 years. It's going on out west and we have more elderly patients that are dying from the flu this year than they have, and I read that today, in a long time. It is a present problem and you're hearing everywhere, get your flu shot, it's not too late to get your flu shot. Three or four months ago, you weren't necessarily hearing that. And, and it, unfortunately, more often than not, I've seen government be, be retroactive. Um, in hindsight, is 2020, of course, but it would be retroactive. You wait till something happens, rather than proactive and trying to prevent it from happening. I, I will tell you, and I think you've known me long enough to know. Uh, for 40 years, I emphasized prevention. An ounce of prevention, a pound of cure, is so so true. Prevention. And one of the most outstanding problems here, and I get way off subject here, uh, prevention is obesity. I and mean, we, we've got an epidemic of obesity in this country that is just incredible, but it's part of the culture. And, and we we are got so much chronic disease now with, with diabetes and other diseases related to obesity that's undoing what good we've, we've, we've uh, done by reducing the smoking rate from 35% to 20%. Uh, government tends to be reactive and, and not proactive, in my experience, at least for core services, environmental services, that is an everyday thing. Uh, here, if, if we had gotten the message out about the tuberculosis patient spreading germs, where everybody really gets concerned when they hear about it, we didn't advertise, but we're not trying to hurt the patient. We're trying to protect the public. The story, of course, we can send out in a general sense. It's a very interesting story. I will tell you, it's a very complex process to go through and a very interesting process. It took a whole lot of time, uh, a whole lot of people. But again, uh, it, 